that's that's why I drove my wife's Highlander out to Kansas, and yeah. so it, it, that was a win in and of itself. Not burying it in one of these <laughs> fields, you know. Yeah, that one ended. It's got well. all-wheel drive, and it, I don't know. It says mud settings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I was like, look, it's muddy. Yeah, it looks muddy. And, uh, <laughs> The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm-hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack sprayer and that since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com and we're back hey you. on our podcast episode 107 nick still snowed in the darn snow yeah. oh that's ice yeah, can't be can't be skiing off the mountain. Yeah, crazy uh, out here. I don't know, you know. We we get the more mild you know stuff down here. It's just raining up here, but or down here. Yeah, it's apparently on the mountain somewhere. Well, we're uh, most people. So it's December twenty second. Uh, Merry Christmas, Merry uh, Chrysler, and uh, Merry Crisis. Uh, we <laughs> we most of the country is getting this just giant cold front blowing through. Um, in fact, like it it's was like Christmas. Yeah. It's like 40 right now. And I think tomorrow the wind chill is going to be negative 30. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, that's, cold. that's a big swing. That's a big swing. Yeah. Uh, I tried to talk to my dad and I was like looking at, you know, there's this deer that's going to mess up here and it's going to be like Christmas Eve. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be like single digits. He's going to be hungry. He's going to be, should moving. probably be out there. Yeah. yeah. Even though I'm going to be there, we're, we're going up tonight. I, he's not going to go, I don't think, until Sunday, which is Christmas Day. But by then, w- we will have left and had our Christmas and stuff already. So. He should probably go Saturday. Well, Jed and Silas might go Saturday. Dun, dun, dun. So, we're, yeah, we're kind of volleying on this deer. It's kind of it's cool. Just It's cool. just normal, se- right? There's a muzzleloader season coming up, too. In January, I think. <sighs> I don't know. January 7th, maybe? I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Um, I try not to think about that. I'm not going to make it to Ohio for a little bit. And then uh, PA opens back up for Bo the 26th uh, in Flintlock. Um, so I'm, I might try to kill one behind the house. And uh, then I'll be in Kentucky for a few days. So I'll uh, I'll try to kill something down there maybe as well. It's going to be warmer though. It's like That's what's weird. It's like it's going to get down to like single digits, like 10, 11 degrees as a high. And then by like the next weekend, it's going to be 50. Global warming. <laughs> uh, dude, it is getting warmer, like, noticeably. Sure. I would say. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's, I mean, obviously, the next three days, nobody's going to say that because it's going to be freaking well, cold. Yeah, we, we still get bouts of it, but, like, I mean, so far this year, we had we had one good cold front per month. We had mm-hmm. a good one mid-October. Mid-November. We had a good one mid-November. And we're getting one now. End of December. The third week of December. Mm-hmm. And everything in between has been like... Pretty mild. 60s. Yeah. Pretty mild. <laughs> well, what's interesting is I think last year it was really cold for a stretch in at least January and February. In fact, that's when I was trying to ice fish and I would like lose my auger down yep. through the ice. There was like a two-week period. Of like, it was pretty cold. Yeah, really cold weather. Because normally we don't have that because I can't even ice fish. It's like... Two inches of ice will fall through. It's between January and February. Yeah, th- it just takes a long time for the winter to actually roll in. You know, you'd think December's Christmas or is... Well, is, and I think we had, like, there was, like, it wasn't a lot, but there was some snow in October. We had snow in October this year. Did we? Yeah. A dusting. Yeah, and, like, I used to be, I remember when people said, man, if it snows before Halloween, like, we're going to get hammered. And then I'm like, it's, like, 65 degrees in December. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it is getting warmer or just more irregular. Like, we you just, you know, hot week, cold week, hot mm-hmm. week, cold week. It seems like it's 
Well, and I mean, can't, it can't count on any consistency, especially in this late season for hunting. We're planning on we need cold weather to get the buck's belly growling to be on the food, and when it's sixty degrees, yeah, they don't do that. So I think I'm at this point probably officially done buck hunting. Done, turning it in forever <laughs> for the season. Oh, <laughs> uh, because I so I went to Kansas since we mm-hmm. had. Pod, Good to see you too, man. Been That's been a long, about. lonely drive, dude. I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a <laughs> long drive. <laughs> There's a lot of driving through good deer hunting to get to good deer hunting. You too. sent me a picture like the night you arrived with the uh, the original cores and like oh, yeah. the living room you looked in. It was like a, it looked like a print ad from 1975. Yeah, it was a cores banquet. So which First brought some legitimacy to it. Uh, well, I was just, you know, back to bring it back to November vibes. We drank a lot of Coors Banquet. So, so I started with one of those. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and, and with yeah, high hopes. Yeah, I stayed at, you know, different Airbnb. So it was, yeah, it was, it was fine. Mm-hmm. Warm. High hopes. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, hope hopes. I mean, I, so I went out there uh, last Wednesday. I drove. Yeah. Last Wednesday yeah. I drove out. Uh, uh, sixteen I will, hours. I will say the day take. the day is much more doable. It's a totally different. When trip. you wake up in the morning and drive, yeah, yeah. totally different trip. Yep. Uh, in fact, I'll say first first twelve of the you know fifteen hour drive. I was yeah. I, was I mean yeah, you're in Missouri right. by that point. Spears were good. I was cranking. Yeah. Um, you know, making phone calls, getting work done. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it gets dark again. You're right. You're right. Cause I left when it was dark at six <laughs> in the morning and then it gets dark again. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like three more hours. Uh-huh. And so the last couple were kind of rough, but, uh-huh. but I made it. Um, so, so wheeled in Wednesday night and, uh, we didn't have anything on camera. Uh, like reminiscent. Of, I was going of on November, dude. Yeah. I was going on nothing. Literally just kind of like, um, you know, and some some hypocrisy here, I suppose, or or just kind of acknowledging that the baiting thing is like, dude, that's that's all you can do. Like in in a state like Kansas, that's sixteen hours away, we don't have the the capacity to plant food plots and out there and stuff. So all the crops are pretty much gone. Basically, the strategy was dump corn piles and see what shows up. Mm-hmm. And I had four days to. to yeah, so you basically to, to, were to try trying that. to get an inventory of what was out there, and then once you inventoried and found a shooter strategize to try to hunt them every day every day is like a ro- it's a rolling strategy it's like see, see if the shooter shows up see if he's huntable mm-hmm. try to hunt him mm-hmm. and so thursday morning um I, I had ordered you know whatever some bags of corn from the co-op the day before so i, I picked those up and f- first plan of action was get three or four different spots out with with cameras and, and corn mm-hmm. and um uh, we've got a buddy there in town that that had put some out at, at one spot beforehand. Then mm-hmm. I pulled that card th- the first morning. Yeah, um, and it had some some decent bucks on it. Uh, but the one grew on me. You know, I, I didn't. He was bigger probably than I thought when I first saw him. Um, well, and we also have history with that deer. In retrospect, we look back, and yeah. I think in twenty twenty, we had him on there as either uh, I would assume a slammer two year old, maybe maybe three, but probably a slammer two year old. Yeah. And so, but I mean, there was two deer at that spot that I figured were four or older. That that other one may may have been older. It just wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, uh, wasn't a high scoring deer. He's like a, a mid thirties, maybe maybe pushing forty eight point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this other one was pro- probably a, a four year old, you know, mid forties eight points. So, so to be honest, you know, I kind of acknowledged that, but I was like, all right, I'm still going to get these other cameras out. And- well, because we we had seen, although it wasn't many, we had seen. Um, at least one, if not two, damn near close booners, high sixties to mm-hmm. low seventies box in November. In November, in mm-hmm. November, yeah. So I was hopeful that you know I could kind of set the trap, and one of these deer would show up on you know day two or three, and I'd be able to make a move and get it done. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> so I, I, I don't know, you know, because so, where'd you sit? You sat. So that's, so that's Thursday morning. Thursday so that's morning. what that's yeah. what I did first. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, I don't have. I don't have any intel or any reason to ha- Set the hunt play. any of these other spots. You know, the, the spot where I had these two deer show up, I was like, that's, you know, the place I'm most likely to see deer. And maybe I get a look at one of these bucks. Maybe I get a shot. Yeah. I've got four days here. So I mm-hmm. look, every hunt is like, man, be in the spot where there's a chance. Yep. And um, so I hunted that spot the first night. 
and this is a stand that uh, it, it, our lease there is basically an 80 acre field mm-hmm. with with a tree line on it that butts yeah, up to uh, to butts up to another property that doesn't get hunted. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, it's a sanctuary. You know, and on, honestly, from, from like an ethics standpoint, we can feel not bad about like pull, pulling deer away from other guys that are trying to hunt this property. It doesn't get hunted. Doesn't get hunted. Um, we, we know it doesn't get hunted. And and so that's, that's honestly what we're trying to do is, you know, if there's deer coming from anywhere, they're not coming from the road. No, they're you know, coming they're, from They're going to come out of this property. And um, so that's the strategy. Wind was blowing basically right out of the wind over my shoulder out into this big 80 acre field. It's cut bean field. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is that these deer will walk, you know, that that your wind's going to essentially blow over them, Mm -hmm. you know, and we hung this stand multiple years ago. In fact, it's the straps aren't even there anymore. It's like it's grown into the tree and it, it's not ideal. You know, I had never hunted it before this trip. Um, you know, but once I got in it, it's like, yeah, yeah, you can, you can shoot out of it and, and yeah, you know, it's, it's just challenging. It, it's, it's, well, a ch- it used to be a couple trees deep on the row and then they, they cleared more of it out to add to the field for planting. They had, right. cause at one point in time, 40 acres of it was tillable and the other 40 was old pasture basically. And then they took down all the fences, and now it's what sixty acres of tillable. Yeah. Um. So when they did that, they also took more of the tree row out to expand the field. I mean, when you're talking about whatever a nearly mile long fence row. You take out twenty five or thirty feet, like that adds a, a you know whole sec section of rows that they can right. put down. Right. So you know. I- <laughs> We've got to stand in this tree, and I and I. We've only killed one deer out of this stand since 2014, too, which is crazy. No deer. No, it's in a different tree than the one you killed from. Yeah, same area though. Same. Same spot. Same spot. Same spot. Different tree. Hmm. Um. And so I don't know. Like, so so much is happening. I mean, it's such a it's so much in a such a short period of time. It's like, you know, start with this 16 hour drive. Immediately next morning, I'm. I'm running around to all these different spots, trying not to bury my wife's Highlander, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. getting the stage set. I, I bumped a nice buck out of one of those spots that morning. Mm-hmm. Ultimately decide on this spot for the first night. So I'm sitting it, you know, I, I get in clean. We've had some deer, you know, borderline daylight in daylight that I would consider shooting, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so I sat that night, I had 13 does, um, and I was counting. I never really count deer. Yeah. It's not it's just not my thing. But I was counting so that I could keep track of eyes. Because mm-hmm. once they get out there, yeah, you're not really. I have to look and see how many deer are in my peripheral. Okay. I can see eight of them. Okay. I know there's five more of them somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. Behind me. Like, so, yeah. so I'm just trying to be very aware of, of, you know, this time of year, they're just, they're just so on edge. You mm-hmm. know, you put a corn pile out there, they're already. I mean, they're, 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 um, they're just being cautious. Sure. So anyways, I, I had 13 does come out from, uh, you know, out of this property and every one of them filters uh, directly under me. And so, and, and we kind of knew that, but quickly think, you know, realized that the, the, the primary route of travel out into this field is, is directly, directly, under the directly under the stand. I mean, brushing against the tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is kind of crazy when you realize like you're out here in kind of a lone tree on this edge and like, you know, um, to our conversation about camo and stuff, um, they never really looked at me. No. Which is interesting. It's like they, they obviously know that this tree and stand is fairly there, high and where they come out to where they're going. I mean, it's a, it's a quick straight shot. Like, it's not like they are walking and seeing you out on the horizon. They're like out. They'd have to look yeah. like this to see. It. Yeah. And it's kind of bizarre because that's what they do. They'll, they'll come out into this little, you know, there, there, there's mm-hmm. another two track back there that they'll stop and, and they'll look out into the field and they'll survey it. And they're just looking right through it as they're doing that. So as long mm-hmm. as you're totally still, yeah, they're not yeah, going to look right at you. Um, and so all 13 of them does filtered right under me. Some of them at some point caught some wind out in the field and they were scurrying around, but can't believe a buck didn't come out with that group. Yeah. And so, and eventually, you know, they all kind of worked off and, and I got out of there fairly clean the first night. Mm-hmm. So that, that was in the book, which is impressive. Cause that's not an easy stand to get out of clean. 
And I, when I say clean, I mean, they were out in the field, but it wasn't like they were watching me get down out of the tree. Right. So yep. that was night one. Uh, night two, so then, you know, mm -hmm. the, the night passes. E every night we're hoping to wake up to, you know, hey, oh, there was one found it. Mm -hmm. You know, one one showed up at the spot or whatever, and it, it, it didn't happen. Um, I think the bucks that had been showing up at this spot were – uh, still showing somewhat regular, showing. but not, not as consistent as we would have hoped with you. You had kind of anticipated cold weather mm -hmm. and then feeding hard and they did, but n it never really got that cold where you are. No. Yeah. I mean, well, it was, yeah, it was like thirties. Yeah. It was like thirties. And so, yeah, the, you know, those bucks would show up at 1130 at night mm -hmm. or, you know, two, two in the morning, um, checking in. And so the second day. Uh, actually, that was the day that I ran and looked at some new leases. Mm -hmm. Um, that were you know sounds like gonna pass on. It just kind of not for us. I don't know. It's just one of them deals. It's like you know, it's it's cattle for for me. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just I'm just not messing with cattle ground. Mm -hmm. You know, guys, guys will tell you, yeah, they don't. You know, it, they don't doesn't bother them any or or whatever, but. Just there's a lot of challenges that come with hunting a property with cows on it. Absolutely, especially when they're on a hundred percent of the property. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, the the only deer you're going to have in bow range is if you put up hog panels and and feed. Yeah, I mean because hog panels. and no deer is going to stay in that that area and eat because the cows have they're not selective eaters. They mow everything in sight, so there's no food for the deer. Um, the cover is probably pretty piss poor. It's just cedars and like, right. like it just isn't, um, again, it's not saying you can't kill a deer on those cause we have, it's just, you need some significant areas of undisturbed property where the cows aren't getting. And it's just rare in that country. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the landowner, uh, drove me around for, for an hour or two and, um, I don't know, it's just kind of a, kind of a, just you know, not not something we wanted to jump on necessarily. I mean, nothing I, made you feel like, oh, there's giants here. You know, it's Kansas, so there's you know, inevitably there's there's a big deer in the area. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. But he also said that we would have had a really tough time killing him with a bow. Oh yeah, which is what we cared about. Yeah, but, you know, he 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 recognized what the property is. You know, and he's you know. I'm sure those deer are on there at some some point sure. in time, but yeah, without a rifle, you're gonna just really really struggle to get close to them. Um, so, anyways, we we elected to pass on that lease, and uh, I went over in the same morning to check out a, a buddy of ours has has a lease in that area too, and he's like, hey, you know, while you're over there, run over and at least pull these cards, and you know, there's a wheat field back there, see what's on it, and so I did that that morning too, and. Um, Ultimately, you know, didn't come up with a lot there. Couple bucks, couple four year olds. So burned the morning in a good way. Got some stuff done, and uh, so I'm headed back to back to town here, kind of making a plan for the evening. And I was like, ah, not a lot to go on, you know, as far as these cameras. Well, and, and again, the time constraint is what the pressure is. It's not like eh, nothing today, not a big deal. Like the clock's ticking. You got only a few hunts. Yeah. Well, and it's not like I can just be like, oh, I'm not going to hunt tonight. You know. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, you, yeah. you have four days, so you gotta hunt somewhere. Um, so I went and hunted a different spot where I had, I'd put a camera out the night before and I, um, they were standing beans and I bumped a, a nice buck. Yeah. So that, that was, I didn't get pictures of him that night. The, the only thing that brought me back to that spot was seeing him mm -hmm. in person. I was like, yeah, it's worth a shot. And, uh, slow night, uh, I saw some deer out in the bean field, but n nothing, nothing in bow range. And, uh, so we're into the th the third day here, and I think the the, the feeling of like uh, just that third week in December <laughs> in Kansas, like it's just remote, dude. It's like we kind of say, man, a lot of these places where big deer live, like y you wouldn't necessarily want to live live there. It, 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 it's it's a different feel, like mm -hmm. when you when you like around here, it's like you know, people are bustling around, you know, get yeah. ready for holidays, and yeah. like you see people for for better or worse, yeah. yeah, you see people and stuff. But out out there, I mean, it just kind of desolate yeah once twice a day like a truck will, did you go uh, to the local did you go to down. benny's every night not every night but but two or three nights you started to become one of the locals yeah yeah started to blend in you know and i mean it's a 
small town, you know. So, but but yeah, no, I was fed well. I did a Walmart trip on the way in. I was doing PB and J's, tuna melts. I had tuna melt one Ooh. night. Very solid. Well, you ate. What'd you get? Prime rib at Benny's the one night. I got pr- How'd you know that? You told me. Yeah, I got prime rib at Benny's. Spot on. I've had it there before. <laughs> one of the better PRs I've had. <laughs> yeah, it was solid. Solid. It was yeah. Solid. Yeah. yeah. That's. I mean, that's cattle country. That's what oh, you get. Uh, that second morning, I went to High's filling station too. Oh, oh did you? Yeah. For breakfast. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought that was good. It was awesome. Not at the main table, satellite table. Uh, no, satellite table, mm-hmm. but much different feel. Not nearly as many November Not farmers. Not near, near as many people. In fact, I brought it up to a few of the, the waitresses on a couple of different occasions. I was like, man, you guys are, we're usually just here in November. Not to be like, yeah. oh, you guys are dead. But, uh. Not many people here as in November, huh? They're like, oh, yeah, once the hunters clear out, it's, you know, this, huh. is, this is it. Wow. <laughs> this is what you get. Crazy. And uh, the Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows. <laughs> or, or a Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> One in the same. Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Huh. Dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th- th- especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I-, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with the RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a sea full of, of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr- proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. So anyways, on to the the third day, and this is kind of the that kind of the highlight and, and also the the detriment of the trip, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, third day, I spent most of the morning driving around. Mm-hmm. Um, Looking for food and Yep, driving past some different, you know, public spots. I did I did a lot of driving. Drove past Toronto and Yeah, I mean, because at this at this point, obviously gun seasons happen. Um but I mean that doesn't rule out. In fact, you know, whatever. The other day we had a decent buck on one of our public cams. But I mean, if there's food next to public on these river bottoms, there's deer there. Right. So I was looking. Yeah. I mean, that time of year, food is you know getting to be critical. So I'm just any anywhere I can find it, you know, is a consideration. And uh, everywhere I found it, I found guys <laughs> too. Still just bird hunting and um you know whatever so so i i essentially didn't find anything better than than where i was at you know we've got some some decent spots there that at at least i've got some some mid-40s deer showing up so so third night end up back at the 80 yep the first spot this is the first spot this is the spot we've got you know at that point i had kind of figured i'm like dude this this one deer is pretty nice you know he's he's probably a a four-year-old super tall tall 145 inch eight point yeah yeah decent you know but best thing i've got Mm -hmm. you know arguably not what you drive to kansas for sure you know i was really hoping that one of these you know uh 160 plus that we'd seen in november would show but it's you know day three they haven't you know and not that my standards are are decreasing at that point but it's you know i'm willing to entertain Mm mm-hmm I probably would have shot the. I would have shot the deer. Well, in retrospect, that, right? we're at whatever day fourteen, and they haven't shown. Yeah. So that they just aren't weren't there. Yeah. So I, I'm back in the eighty, and and same deal. I I know ahead of time. I'm like that. The stand is just. It, it's gonna be tough. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, I'm either gonna have to something's gonna see me draw, or I'm gonna have to. I don't know. You know, yeah. I, I, I could try to imagine every single scenario possible, and believe me, I I did it. Yeah. Um, but until it happens, it's, it's just, it's impossible to, to see it all the way through. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was, uh, I'm going to say around four, four 30, I had like, uh, I had two fawns and a doe, Mm -hmm. um, kind of come down and, uh, did the same thing all the does did the night before a bunch of them worked underneath underneath me and they they go over this corn pile Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm kind of not looking at them just because I'm trying to sure. I'm trying to focus on where these deer are coming from and just knowing that these ones are over my shoulder here. And mm-hmm. I think at some point they worked off and, you know, they were out in the field or something like that. And so it was about 5, five o'clock, mm-hmm. maybe 5.05. Oh five. Um, you know, they just, here they come. They start to pour it. Here's dough from this direction. Here's dough mm-hmm. from this direction. 
And um, the, there was probably t- two or three other does that, you know, that filtered in and kind of did, did the same thing and worked under me. And then there's a defined trail of does that here they come. Okay, there, I, there's one, two, mm-hmm. three, four, five. The sixth one comes working out. And, and all of them filter out into this little two track that's yeah. kind of in front of me. It's actually across the property, so I can't I can't shoot over there. Right. Um, and they all come out of come out into this two track and then last but not least here comes that 145 inch eight point and i'm like there he is Mm -hmm. you know it's it's just it's it's a weird feeling to describe because it's like you know it can happen yeah but when he's actually there standing in front of you it's like can't believe it's some somewhat of an element of disbelief yeah but but also okay you know here here we go and when i saw him there was no question i was i was going to try to get a shot at this year yep Looked great. I mean, um, heavy bases. He's got some stickers and some trash stickers on at them. the base. Yeah, just nice, nice tall. Um, he probably would be all over 150 if he had brow tines, but his brows yeah. were like m- minuscule for sure. So nice deer, nice deer. And uh, I was I was gonna try to get a shot at him, and so I've got maybe a few deer at the corn pile behind me, six does on the two track right in front of me, staring through me. And that buck, you know, they they are smart enough to kind of use all those does as their eyes and ears. Mm-hmm. So he's just, he's worried about them and getting to the corn pile at some point. Mm-hmm. And so he he kind of walks up to where they're all at, stops for just a second, kind of kind of looks, and then just keeps on coming. And so he's 15 yards at this point. And, I, I mean, he looks right through me, not never at me. He's just looking out in the field. And here he comes. He's going to come right down his trail directly under the stand. And he does. But, you know, before I can even, mm-hmm. as I'm, it's playing out in real time, he comes and walks right under me. And I'm, I literally could just like fall out of the left side of the tree and fall on his deer. And it's not that high in a tree either, dude. No, it's I mean, 15, 15 16 mm-hmm. feet in the tree. And so there he goes. He's, he's down and under me. And at that point, I just, you know, there's some fi- fight or flight that you, you're like to make something happen here. Mm-hmm. And it's hard not to rush because, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen with all these other deer in the field. Um, so you're trying to trying to make the right decision just just instinctually. And the decision that I made at that point was to stand. And get my bow. Was to stand and get my bow. Mm hmm. So I did that. So so he walks f- from in front of me to, to behind me, and as he's doing that, I stand, put the seat up, get the get my bow off the hook, mm-hmm. knowing full well that some of these does in front of me probably will see me, mm-hmm. but that the buck has already passed me. So that, that's so what I'm that's yeah. what, who I'm worried about. You mm-hmm. know, even if he boogers or something, I should mm-hmm. you know I can get a shot, and that's what you're banking on. So I do that. I get it. I and I turn. And so I'm here and I realize that he's heard me and, and he stops and quarters back to me just perfect for a shot. So, so he's quartering away. So he's quartering away at like 15 yards mm-hmm. directly behind the tree from me. Mm-hmm. And so when he starts to quarter like that, I'm realizing, okay, he's heard that he's going to give me a shot here. I come to full draw. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, and transparently, not a spot that I expected to shoot. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, he's either going to be out on this part of the field or I'm going to have to wait for him to get all the way over to, like, Mm -hmm. the corn pile area. Mm -hmm. And they're two totally different shots. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm either on this side of the tree with my my, uh, tether Mm -hmm. on on this side or I'm totally on this side of the tree with the tether on Mm -hmm. this side. So it's just just not ideal. Sure. Um, But but so there he is. Uh, You know, he quarters back. Uh, you know, away from me to look back in my direction. And I come to full draw as he's doing that. And I duck just a little bit. And it's, I mean, I'm right on him. It's, it's perfect. Uh, you know, just put the arrow right on the vitals and, and I let it go. And it, and it soars right over his back, like, like six, six inches over him, four, four to six inches, right, right over top of him. Per- Perfect left and right, as far as I can tell, but right over him, buries into the ground, and he, j- you know, he kind of take, takes takes a leap or two, and I'm like, 
I can see clearly that I missed. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. And I'm like, so I'm trying to process like, wh wh how, why did that happen? What's, you know, and at the same time, I'm seeing him just take a few trots and stop again. I have no idea what happened with the does at this point. Sure. I assume half of them saw me stand up and, and maybe have already it boogered. boogered. Mm -hmm. So I, I go to knock another arrow. I was mm -hmm. like, he's standing out there. You know, I'm, I'm going to, I don't know what happened, but I got to get another arrow in. <clears throat> so I do, or as, as I'm doing that, I try to, you know, move my bow to get in a position where I can pull an arrow out and stuff. And I, and it, it's like caught and I'm realizing that it's, it's like stuck on something. And I look and I see it's caught on the easy hanger mm. that I that I had my bow hanging on. And not only it's not just the riser, it's the cam has pinched it between the limb. So like when you shot the easy hanger like end was in between the limb and the cam. And when you shot it Yes. Somehow. How that happened without the bow exploding, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't either. Because it was literally I could not get the bow off the easy hanger without half drawing it. To open up to... Yeah, to open the cam up. Jeez. So, I mean, you talk about a, a scramble. You know, I'm trying to, like, at, at this point, it's like it's a matter of time before he sees me. Sure. I'm totally silhouetted <laughs> out in this tree. I mean, it's just, it, it falls apart pretty darn quick. Oh, yeah. Somehow, I, I get the thing drawn enough to get it off the easy hanger. I knock another arrow. I move the bow to the other side of the tree. I get my tether onto this side of my head. I come to full draw again, and I figure him for 25, but maybe 30 yards mm -hmm. at most. I'm going to say 25 yards, mm -hmm. and he's just standing there, and he's just looking back and forth, looking back and forth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel this is one of the, this is a window where I, I had said, you know, this is a clear shooting window for sure. me. It's not like I'm forcing anything here. I draw back, I put it on him again. I, you know, I'm just holding for long, double long. And I shoot, and the shot felt really good. And we'll talk about maybe what might have led to this. Yep. But I hit him high, mm -hmm. really high. Not lethal is my immediate opinion. Which is normally the right opinion. Talking back straps high, you know, not, you know, under under the spine. I mean, it, it got in him uh, enough that the arrow, st I had a Luminox, so stuck stuck in him mm -hmm. most, most of the way through. So well, you think you were under the spine? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's kind of like high no man's land if I had to put a, put a thing on it. So I, so I see this happen, you know, there, I, you know. And his reaction is what? Runs off. Yeah. Just runs off. Um. I mean, at that point, it's just, you know, I'm just like cussing at myself under my breath of like, what, of course, you know, what, what's happening here? Like, right. There's just, uh, so to finish it out, he, he ran off, bolts through this, uh, row of timber that I'm in. Mm -hmm. I hear some crashing. I see him on the other side of it, still running all the way back and around into the thicket he came from. Mm -hmm. with no arrow in him. Mm -hmm. So I figure that he threw the arrow mm -hmm. at some point over there. And so I just kind of, you know, I, I saw clearly everything that happened. Like I, you know, first one was clean miss. Second one was really high. Mm -hmm. Saw him run off all the way to where he went, realized he shed the arrow. Those were all gone at that point. Sure. Um, so I just, uh, you're just pissed. I was pissed and I was frustrated um, decided to get down. I was like, e even if another mm -hmm. buck came out, I was like, I have to at least see, you mm -hmm. know, I can't shoot another deer. At this. Like, right. I've got to, I've got to make sure that that's not a lethal hit. Yep. So I got down pretty quickly after that, mm -hmm. 10 minutes after I got everything down, walked out briefly to where I hit him and didn't see anything. I mean, it's just, it's a 80 acre cornfield sure. or cut, be cut bean field. So it's, you know, chances of me finding anything. I kind of, I kind of, kind of try to walk where he ran and I'm like looking for blood it, it's plenty of daylight it's five mm -hmm. it's 5 15 when I shot him it was five it's 10 minutes later it's 5 25 didn't get dark till 5 45 mm -hmm. last night and I walk all the way till I can see the luminot glowing on the other side of the tree line mm -hmm. um and 
and I uh, recovered it, and there was more blood on it than I thought. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, basically. And I only found the back half of the arrow, maybe like the last eight inches. It broke the rest off. The rest yeah. was broke off. I did end up finding it the next morning. but So I just had, you know, the blood on the arrow mm-hmm. basically to go on. There's still, even in this 15, 20-yard stretch where I verifi- verifiably could, I he definitely ran yeah. through here, not not a drop of blood. Hmm. So, um, <laughs> I don't know. Called you on the way out. Yeah. We talked through it. Uh, yeah, which at that point, my concern was, and again, it all happens so fast, is that that first shot would have damaged the cam, which would have forced your second shot high. Yeah. So, so okay. I, so, I don't know still what, what caused that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because, I mean, you said your pin was on 25, right? Mm-hmm. I leave it on 25. So, I mean, unless he was at 20, which doubtful, there's, uh, I mean, if he's at closer to 30, you're shooting low, not high. Sure. And honestly, he probably was right around 25 yards. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, shouldn't have been four or five inches high. No. Um, the best I can figure is that he, is he, that he ducked. Yeah, he was just on super alert. There, there's always the possibility that something happened with, with me. I mean, usually things are user error. Well, and especially at that point because you're scrambling. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it, you know, it, after that first shot's gone, I mean, it's, I, I can't believe I even got my bow drawn a second time. Sure. Um, but, I mean, I, I feel like I was able to slow it down and, like, the shot felt good when I made it. Mm-hmm. And all I know is that it hit much higher than... I wanted it to, or, mm-hmm. or that I thought that were that I was aiming, mm-hmm. and so uh, pro- probably the most likely, uh, I would say the chances that he ducked the arrow mm-hmm. are pretty good. Sure, you know, it just it's not uncommon for them to do that at all, especially when he's already on high alert, especially after he's been shot at once, um, you know, and at, and at that. That yardage, granted, it's not super far, you know, but but, He'll it, react. but if it was 25, 30 yards, yeah, he's got more time to react. And so that's that's the best I can figure. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to like really yep. shoot my bow a whole lot. I shot it out of hay bale once mm-hmm. afterwards and it seemed pretty on. Mm-hmm. Um, time, time will tell with that one, but sure. Uh, I, I think he just ducked it. And so basically. <laughs> It was a long night. I mean, I, I, I think I slept for three or four hours and then mm-hmm. I woke up at like one thirty, and I could, I just couldn't get back to sleep. I was just like, man, I started feeling kind of optimistic when I saw the arrow. Well, yeah. Cause I mean that, that was the one where I'm not surprised there was blood further up the shaft because you hit it like the thinner part of the cavity. So the arrow had penetrated deeper, mm-hmm. you know, so it should be closer to the, to the veins. Um, but I mean, it sounded like there was a decent amount of blood. It was all the way up to it. The veins was all the way to the yeah, or the blood was all the way up to the vein. Yeah, so like you know, obviously it's cavity. And like, did you nick the top of the lung? Did you hit an artery around on the top of the back? You know, below the spine, because there is, you know. Well, that's what that's kind of the only hope that I had. I was like, I know that's not lungs. It's it's too high. Sure. Um, I don't know where that artery's at, but dude, I've hit a couple deer in that no man's land that just seems like there ain't nothing there that's going to kill them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's an interesting one. Cause I don't know. I, I know there's been a lot of arguments and frankly, I'm not one to, uh, my brain's not in the capacity to think about it, but <clears throat> you know, people talk about that no man's land and, um, you know, anatomically there's people that will argue that the lungs are so big that it's almost impossible to either not hit the spine and or part of the lung. Like there just isn't a gap there that exists. Mm. Um, now that said, I mean, just like anything, your lungs inflate, deflate, like maybe at certain times there's more gap there. Um, because I mean, that spine is, is pretty prominent there, you know, and then you're talking about probably a smaller area below that spine to the lungs. Now that said, based on the angle and stuff, my, my thinking was if you hit high, and come out lower, you hit maybe top of opposite lung, and that's not a lethal hit on that deer. Mm-hmm. I mean, he don't like it, 
and it'll bleed. But it, you, number one, you won't find much blood. Number two is it's just going to be cavity blood. Um, so like literally the cavity would have to fill up and it won't if it's, it's high, high lung on that. <sighs> but so the, the next morning I went <clears throat> and, uh, went right back to where the arrow was mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, I was thinking overnight, I was like, dude, the other half of that arrow is not buried in him. I said, it's got to, no, he, cause it should have been sticking out. He had to have thrown it somewhere as well. And uh, sure enough, I, f I found it right there in the tree line. So he, when he broke that arrow, both fell out right away. Both sections fell out within yeah five yards of each mm -hmm. other. <clears throat> I just found the one with aluminum quicker. Sure. <clears throat> and, um, uh, not as good a blood on the front half of the arrow. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it was like, it was what I thought it would, it would just look like fat, fatty like tissues, back fat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like if you see a, a caped out deer, like, you know, at this point in the season, all the fat that they have left is just right straight up, straight up the spine at their back. Yeah. You know, it's right on their back. <clears throat> and, uh, so, I mean, that's, it didn't surprise me to see that. I had two halves of arrow now. I was like, okay, you know, basically all I can do at this point is uh, there's another big stretch of field here that he ran through that I can <clears throat> kind of try to spot some blood. Yeah, but it's big CRP. But it's, it's big. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I walked it, didn't find any blood, and got to the point where I was hopeful that I would pick something up, which is where he ran back into this thicket. Mm -hmm. And it's a fence line there. Um, so I spent an hour, an hour and 15 minutes probably just – just zigzagging from the trail or from on the fence line and anywhere he would have crossed it, trying to just pick, to see any trying blood. to pick up where he might have crossed it. You know, there's a few obvious crossings. You know, I, I really focused there, mm -hmm. and, and as I was doing that, I was just slowly working down in the direction he would have run to like you know at some point I'm going to cut his trail here. Yeah, and it's maybe maybe a 50, 40, 50 yard yep. stretch where he ran he ran through this somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, kept working that and uh, kept working it, kept working. And I never did find a drop of blood. And, and that search for blood eventually turned into a, a, grid. a grid search. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only so much, um, there's only so much property that it could be in there. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I gridded it pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I I, I was using the, the track feature there on Hunt Stand to just see where my uh where i had been and it's, i sent it to you too yeah, it's, you covered it's covered it. and he ain't, he's not he ain't in, there. in there and so i didn't think it was a lethal hit mm -hmm. the, the the gridding confirms for me and lack of blood confirms for me that that probably is the case um so at least i can feel good about you know the the, the deer i don't think is, is mortally wounded but it'll be interesting to see if he pops back up on that pile here in the next couple weeks and a raccoon's mess with the camera so that's all no it's great it's wonky now but Go figure but maybe you know the hunter podcast is brought to you by stealth cam dude where would we be without our cell cams i would definitely be divorced at this point <laughs> yeah i hear that <laughs> i mean the fact is is i spent more time checking cameras than i actually did hunting prior to cell cameras now at least my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home buried in my phone checking those pictures 100 yeah, percent. and dude when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras. Reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. StealthCam.com. Check them out. Yeah, I did. Dude, it's just kind of a. It's a. It's a. It's a low spot to be in. A heartbreaking end to the season. You know, it's it's not like it's a deer I've been hunting the whole year. Sure. And, you know, you just you just hate it. Just like man, how many how many things can go wrong in mm -hmm. in that moment? Mm -hmm. You know, and f you know, just for it to be that for for him to for me to drive that the distance and for it to, for him to give me the opportunity. And for it to not work out, even though I, I, I kind of feel like it's not, it's not really my fault. Sure. Gr granted, you know, you could say, well, be more aware of your, uh, of the surroundings of your boat. Yeah, you're right. Well, I was going to say, I mean, in, in retrospect, anything 
anything different that you could have thought of? Like, I mean, obviously you could say, well, yeah, I should have checked to make sure my bow hanger wasn't in the way. Or, That's all it would have took. Yeah. It's all it would have took. If I mean, if my bow didn't get caught in that easy hanger, that's a dead deer. And I mean, in, I guess thinking back on that, is it like, do you think like, shouldn't have put my easy hanger there or I should have folded it back or I didn't anticipate that shot. So that's why I it was folded there. It back. Yeah. When I, when I took, took it off, you should have pushed it, it out. Yeah. Which is, it's, it's amazing how, like when we sit and talk about it. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. You want to. Cause but you feel you like put you, your bow hanger in a spot and you want to, when you take your bow off the hook, you want to move it. Like, I feel like most of the time, if it's in a shooting lane, like if it's in behind me, I don't worry about, but in shoot, like I'll take it off and I'll just use my cam to kind of, you know, just mm -hmm. swipe it out of the way. Well, and that's why when I say this, the setup was not ideal. I, I didn't like either of the spots that I had to put the easy. Sure. Hand. I'm like, I either, I'm either going to put it here and I can grab it like this fairly easily. Mm-hmm. Or I can put it over here mm -hmm. where I think most of these deer ultimately are going to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Both of them are potentially in a shooting lane at some point or another. And just, yeah, I, I just like, if, if it can go wrong, it, it will go wrong. And when, when you boil it down to this shooter buck is literally under you and there's six or eight other does probably looking at you. Mm hmm the thought process of like yeah, hey, move the there. easy hanger and uh, you know sure. when you draw your bow back like yeah it's not there it's just tough to do yeah i agree it's tough to do hmm. yeah it's tough man i mean and <clears throat> you know like you said you don't ever want to kind of end the the note or the trip on that i mean you know and it was one of those things we've had the conversation of is that we like we knew we knew you were going to or at least trying to get back out there um you know, weird year, uh, in that, you know, we basically weren't there last year. So this was the first year back. Um, and frankly, probably one of our poorest, uh, big buck sighting years in Kansas. Um, you know, we saw a couple decent ones, but, uh, you know, if I go back to 2020 or 19, right? Like, I mean, lots of, lots of shooter deer on camera, not the case this year. Um, for whatever reason. Also, again, listen back on some of our podcasts, some of the most pressure we've ever seen out there, you know, and I'm not saying that that area is like wiped out, but like, uh, something's having an effect on those deer. It's, it's funny that you bring it up and I know we go down this route all the time, so I'm, I'm not going to go all the way down it today, but I, so one of those days I was driving around mm -hmm. and I told you I was, uh, I was just scouting for food. I ran into a group of guys, uh, from, they were, they were not locals, but, but, you know, residents of Kansas. And uh, we, we just got to, to talk and, you know, we're like, oh, you know, have you hunted down in this spot before? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, yeah, you know, it's a good spot, you know, whatever. And, uh, they were bird hunting. They were, they were scouting for next year's season. I got, gotcha. but they brought the shotguns to see if they could kick anything up. And it's funny, this guy on his own volition is the first to call out. He's like, dude, crossbows have just totally changed. When did you think that they introduced crossbows to Kansas? 2013. That's what I said, and he seemed to think it was much more recent. No. I mean, we saw the press release, 13 or 14. 13. He yeah. seemed to think it was like 2019. Really? Yeah. For To open it up for anybody to use. Maybe. I mean, I, I thought it was like a youth and senior in 2012, 13, and then the next year, wide open to everybody. Yeah. Well, anyways, I just thought it was funny. Still that, recent. That he, that he, <laughs> I just kind of shook my head and was like, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that the... Yes, that has a big impact. I think the out-of-state leasing, and we're guilty of it because we do it, but I think the out-of-state leasing has been a, a major factor on that because a lot of your residents who probably hunted their entire lives by permission are getting booted off of property because somebody's coming in and waving cash in front of the, the landowner. And I can't blame the landowner, right? I mean, his, sure. his job is to make money off of his property. Um, and, and in tandem with that, uh, and no knock to like whether it's guys like us coming from Pennsylvania or Georgia or Florida or wherever, um, we just don't see the caliber of deer that they have in Kansas. And so you see a 150 inch deer and you're like, that's a giant and you shoot it and it's a three year old and that's your future 180, 190 in Kansas who's no longer there. So, I mean, it's, it's a domino effect and it comes back to the, you know, well, don't tell me what to shoot because I, what I shoot doesn't affect you is it's bullshit because it does you know and um 
I think that the resident, I, I feel bad for the Kansas residents ultimately because they've had a Mecca, um, not necessarily like a kept secret, but they've had a Mecca by the way that that um, resource has been protected from people not from the state of Kansas. Um, and that guard has been let down significantly in the last, you know, eight years from inclusion of crossbows to um, COVID and, and, you know, tag allocations and all of the, all of the above. Um, and clearly it is, it is, it is just a fact. It has affected the quality of deer in that state. Um, that's not to say that there aren't giants out there because there still are lots of things. Yeah. I mean, lots of things have, but, but it's just, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough position to be in, you know, and I think we spent more time talking to locals this year than we have in years past. And it was because, you know, we kind of felt like, hey, some of these things that are happening seem like they're negatively affecting, but well, we're not here, but a right. couple we weeks just see here. glimpses in time. We're like, hey, you know, this rut week wasn't as good or, you know, mm -hmm. didn't seem like. And then we didn't find as many sheds this year or found a lot of small sheds. But come to find out, yeah, it's it's confirmed by guys that live there that spend a lot of time there that are just like, yeah, you know, it's just not, not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. Which is most things, right? I mean, that's, that is yeah. how hunting goes, but, um, yeah. Anyways, I mean, <laughs> it uh, it is interesting, you know, to to take a look back and again, we had some great deer on camera. Thus, while you're back out there, we had a couple 160s on camera that you know I think would have um, we had hoped made it through, and maybe they did, you know. Um, but uh, you know, only time will tell, and you know whether it's we'll so. See. Yeah. Anyways, we I did it. You know, I, I went out and I had my opportunity and blew it. Uh -huh. And, uh, that's how it goes sometimes. And now I'm back. <laughs> and now you're uh, back. So it's, I mean, so, you, you know, you started this podcast by basically saying, yeah, I think I'm done hunting bucks. I mean, that's because you're tagged out in tagged Ohio. Tagged out in Ohio. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have anything to shoot in Pennsylvania. So, no. So, and, and I'm not driving back to Kansas. Yeah. So does on the yeah I'll shoot some does on a home farm. Uh, Dad still has a tag mm -hmm. um, that I'm trying to trying to get him on the deer I was hunting mm -hmm. earlier in the year, which is, big a, eight. which is a stud. Mm -hmm. And uh, did I tell you Lebrowski showed up? The other yeah, day? you sent me a picture of it. Yeah, kind of out of nowhere. The same area. Yeah, he was there this summer. But man, what a roamer! Like mm -hmm. he's just he's covered All mi miles and miles. Hmm. Pretty crazy. No wonder he's not getting killed. I think he's just. He's yeah. so inconsistent. Like, if anybody had any knowledge of him, he's gone. Yeah. It's just going to be luck that he gets vulnerable. Yeah. So, but, I mean, yeah, dude, I, I, I'm i happy, you know, with, with you know, my, my November success. It was kind of, it was kind of, kind of a whirlwind there with, I still don't have my truck back from, uh, from hitting that deer the day before I shot my buck. Up November 2nd Two or months third. ago. Yeah. So... That's that's why I drove my wife's Highlander out to Kansas, and yeah. so it, it, that was a win in and of itself. Not burying it in one of these <laughs> fields, you know. Yeah, that one ended. It's well. got all wheel drive, and it, I don't know. It says mud setting. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it looks muddy. Yeah, it looks muddy. And it looks uh, muddy. so I didn't didn't bury it. You know, I got I got my opportunity, and it's just you know, it's just another learning experience. Um, just to just be aware of your surroundings, I guess. Yeah, and I mean it. It um, I'm. You know, I, I would assume many of us listen to this use, you know, some sort of, you know, tree hanger, right? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more people on here who have had issues with tree hangers in oh, the past. There's a lot, dude. Yeah. I know, I know a lot of people that have had like limbs hit off their camera arms or mm -hmm. off their bow hangers. Like it's a, it's a very common thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I've hit, I've hit my limb on a shot off of a, maybe a camera arm probably more than a, a tree hanger, but same, same principle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just, I mean, you got to think about it. You're in a, you're in a tight tree stand. Like you only got much, so much room to move around and you're trying to keep yourself as pinned to that stand as possible. Um, yeah, it's just, Dude, it, ju it just absolutely kills me to know. I just didn't, I didn't think it was important enough. Like I, you know, I didn't love the, the way that that stand was in a tree. Sure. But I thought that I could, I might be able to get away with it. And had I gone in the second time I hunted that and okay. hung another stand in that tree that I saw across from there, I feel like I would have absolutely killed that deer. Sure. 
Yeah, that spot is hard uh, just because of how tight it is in that corner and and the way that this deer come out. Like I said, and you know we've had I think two or three different sets in that little corner there, and I the first year we had the lease is the year I killed white whale, and that's the only deer we've ever killed out of that corner. <laughs> Right. You know, and that's not for lack of hunting that corner. In fact, one of our guys hunted it every day, basically, when we were there in November. So, yeah. um, yeah, it just, it, it, uh, there's a lot of deer there. It just poses a lot of challenges and movement and tight quarters and eyeballs and, you know, even wind to a point. Um, because it's literally sitting on a north south tree line. So anything that is northwest and or southwest could potentially blow to the field where the deer you're gonna shoot are gonna be. Yeah. Um Yeah, it's just, you know, not ideal, but you know, he, he came out and he was there. It just you know, what I was saying I think a couple of weeks ago, the ability to get the thing killed, even though he's more than in bow range, like I yeah. literally could jump out on him. Um it's just hard. Well, when you call me, I'm like, okay, You're like it, he slung for sure. And then like the disappointment and your voice was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you hear in the story, it's just like, man, like I can see how it happens. I also am very surprised your bow didn't like explode or that, that, uh, that cam didn't bend or mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, cause you're talking about there's a, in that rubber, you know, coating, there's a piece of steel where that bow hanger is. And it is, you showed me the picture. I sent you the picture. It's freaking bent. Yeah. Like, oh, dude, it was not easy to bend back either. I mean, it took a substantial amount of pressure to bend that easy hanger. <laughs> Literally, my bow cam alone is what did that. Yeah, which is why I thought, like, because when you said then the second time, you're like, well, I, shot, I was like, dude, it's your bow cam. Damn and it, it is possible, you know, that there's something off for sure. It could be with, like, the timing or something. I'll, I'll have to, you know, I'll, I'll shoot at a better target here sure. before too long and we'll know, but. Jeez. Whether it's that or, or he ducked or just uh, being frazzled after that first shot and, and just user error or a combination of all three. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say non-lethal hit on a deer. Chalk it up. He's gone. Dude, I came back with quite a few antlers uh, for not killing a deer, though. He did. He found several sheds, right? I found a couple sheds. Decent? Yeah, decent. Mm-hmm. Probably uh, I found a mash set off a three-year-old and I found another single off a three-year-old. Cool. Um, we probably won't be able to match those up because we didn't really have cameras running out there last year. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Interesting, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, again, you know, we're sitting here at the end of December. You're listening to this. It's, it is the new year. Uh, it's 2023. You know, and seasons are just, I mean, the, the curtain is closing quick. You know, if you're in Pennsylvania, you've got probably... I don't know, 10, 12 days max left. Same with Kentucky, 10, 12 days max. I think West Virginia's closed. Ohio stays open quite a while. Um, I have seen quite a few people uh, talking about shed bucks. That's what I asked you. That one buck that was killed um, not far from Jed's place or whatever, were those freshy sheds or were there, was that, I think that those deer were from prior year? Hit that deer sheds. But yeah, we've I've seen a few. few Higgins seasons. posted one the other day. He found a big shed on somebody's property. Wow. So, I mean, you know, and I say that because if you're out there trying to make this thing happen late, or even like me, I'm going to go out and try to kill him a Trudeau, you know, double check that target a couple times, you know, if you're worried about killing an antler, yeah. list buck. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think at this point, if um, you got to start flipping to the glass half full where it's like, okay, who made it? Um, what, what are the projects I've got at hand? If you're hunting public land, what, you know, I love, I love scouting in January and February. Um, you know, typically I won't scout too much in January just because I'm going to try to make a swing through on, on sheds at the same time, you know, but if it, whether it's private or public, you know, come February, I'm walking those woods pretty, pretty stout. Um, I may even try to go in and cut. I've got one of those, uh, those, uh, habitat pools, um, that uh, Elinger promotes. Okay. Um, like a pole saw? Uh, no, it's like it's got like a like a curved claw end on it. So you basically can make your hinge cut. You can get up. It'll extend to like 18 feet. You get up high and you can pull it down. Oh, yeah. To bend that thing down. Yeah. So I bought one of those. I might even try, um, you know, in the next week or two, 
to go in and do some significant cuts in some of my areas just to drop some brows down here for, you know, the last part of the season and then into February, um, you know, and then sometime in February or March do a heavier, you know, TSI cut through some areas. But yeah, I mean, you just kind of, you know, it's crazy, man. I feel like we were just sitting here probably, I don't know what it would have been episode 80 something. And we're like, here we are. It's October. Yep. Welcome to October. Came and went. We had another one, you know, and, uh, yeah. And it started all over again here. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at cyclically in the year is just, you know, ho- holidays are, you know, on, we've been working on books. You got tax season coming up. We kind mm-hmm. of restart and like, you know, the, the bulk effort of our, it's happening all year round, but you know, Management. starting into the new year, um, mm-hmm. you know, we're hoping to, to fire some things up and before you know it, it'll be, it'll be July, August. We'll start getting cameras out again and yeah, I gotta do it all over again. Pull like sixty cameras back in, reel them all in. In the meantime, I, we've got a lot of good guests planned for the coming year and stuff. And uh, yes, maybe uh, a little bit better strategy for for keeping some of this stuff as as real time as as possible. Yeah, we're gonna tighten it up here after the holidays. Um, also, sometime probably in January, February at the latest. Um, we'll start getting the I bought a farm stuff cranked back up. I'm not sure exactly how we're gonna do that and syndicate it, but. Um, we'll have that kind of paired back out there as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just going to be, you know, as we kind of phase out of the hunting side, um, with the seasonality, you know, we're, we're going to inevitably start talking about shed hunting and, and scouting and, um, you know, habitat work and things like that. And, uh, you know, there'll always be an element of hunting action in what we discuss, but, you know, some of it in the next four to six weeks is going to be, you know, what survived and how do we plan on moving forward. Um, but if you're still after them, good luck. You got a few weeks left at least. If you're in the South, you're cranking. Um, and if you're listening to this, Happy New Year. Watch out for your bow hangers. That's it. We'll catch you next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.